लाइफ Samay, you want to put it on full screen? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll just be starting. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the next edition of uh, Learn from the Masters. And uh, it seems to be quite popular now. And uh, for today's session, we have Dr. Soumya, who will be who's a consultant in the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, based out of Shankarai Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, she'll be talking on sensory motor evaluation for strabismus. Uh, this is this topic is quite important for not only for the DNB students for the exam, but also also for the fellows and also in the general ophthalmology who is practicing. It's going to be very helpful. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Soumya. Yeah, very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Okay, so let's start off with the uh, topic for today, which will be on sensory motor evaluation of strabismus. So let's start with the overview of, the, of my talk would include, what do we evaluate first? Are we evaluating the sensory system or the motor system? Why do we need to evaluate the sensory system? We also look at what are the various tests, how we could evaluate the sensory system. Are we just evaluating the system per se, or are we looking at uh, diagnosing some of the anomalies of sensory system? What are the caveats of motor evaluation? And a quick summary and a take home. So whenever we talk of binocular single vision, what we are referring to is the simultaneous use of the, both the eyes to give a single mental impression in the normal conditions of view. It basically means that you're using two eyes together to get a binocular depth. In essence, when we look at the minion picture, we get a better idea that we have two eyes, but we are looking at the world as if, as though we had a single cyclopean eye and we are looking at the world per se. So that's exactly what we mean by binocular single vision. When we talk of the fusion anomalies, we also have to understand two basic terms, one being a motor fusion, the second being a sensory fusion. When we say motor fusion, we are looking at the ability of the eye to physically move both the eyes in synchrony in all the possible directions so that the same image is formed on both the eyes. It is basically ability to maintain a single fused image during versions or version moments. Unlike in a sensory fusion, when we are talking about, we are looking at the ability to appreciate the two similar images, one with each eye, and to interpret them as one. So both of them are linked to each other in the sense that the sensory fusion gives the necessary feedback for the motor fusion, and thus the motor fusion or the ocular movements are able to adjust themselves so that we gain the sensory fusion again. So both of them are linked together in instability. So now coming on to why do we need to evaluate a sensory system? We by all uh, by and large we evaluate the sensory system first, and then we evaluate the motor system. When we are looking at why do we do sensory evaluation before the motor system? What do we understand is any motor evaluation involves the dissociation of the two eyes. That is, we cover one of the eye and we dissociate the system. Thus creating a bias when we do a motor evaluation first and then we do a sensory evaluation. So that is the need why we do a sensory evaluation before a motor system evaluation. Well, why do we need to evaluate a sensory system? Why don't we just look at what is the angle of the squint and then correct it? We have to know what is the grades of BSV and the presence of sensory anomalies in a way. And as we have already looked into, a sensory system is a glue which acts to the motor system. Both of it per se helps us get a binocular single vision. So we can't just look at the motor system and look at the squint per se. It also helps us to tailor the surgical plan per se primarily because the patients who have a fusional potential should be slightly overcorrected and those without fusional potential should be slightly undercorrected. In all cases of sensory strabismus, we always aim at slight overcorrection. So your surgical plan is also dependent on your sensory system of the individual per se who has a strabismus. So that is why we need to assess the sensory system per se. When we look at sensory system evaluation, we are also looking at what we are trying to assess is basically grades of binocular vision. This is one of the familiar pictures with all of you. Most of the 
postgraduates as well the first picture indicating when we can fuse two dissimilar objects like a screen with a pot which is basically a simultaneous perception ability of the eye to fuse two dissimilar images the second one being fusion where we are able to fuse two similar images or two similar objects with incomplete details which is called as fusion and the last one being a the same object viewed from two different perspective and thus able to get in the depth of the image being perceived so that is what we call it as a stereopsis so the three grades of binocular fusion would uh, vision would be simultaneous perception followed by fusion and a stereopsis so whenever we are assessing a strabismus case per se or a patient with strabismus what we first start off with is the stereopsis assessment when we look at stereopsis assessment we could uh, look at it either looking at it in terms of qualitative stereopsis or a quantify the stereopsis in a way the uh, for the postgraduate per se how do we classify or how, how do we remember the test easily is basically that stereopsis the test which need polarized glasses or red and green glasses which include tetmus flightus the most popular the rando test the tno or the rando e test rando e test re requiring polarized glasses tno requiring red and green glasses or the test which don't require glasses which is one of the questions which is most commonly asked in the exam these include frisbee a lang test 1 and 2 and lastly synoptophore with stereopsis slide so those which need glasses those which don't need glasses these are all the tests for near stereopsis that is a 33 cm max up to 40 cm so what do we do with distance stereopsis distance stereopsis we would require a ao vectograph or a mentor bward system which is in place in order to assess the stereopsis at distance first start off with how do we assess stereopsis qualitatively the most popular test and the most commonly performed is the lang test which we could do it either vertically or horizontally so how do we basically do it the examiner or the uh, observer holds a pencil in front of the patient in question and asks the patient to hold the pencil on top of it so in vertically when we hold the pencils vertically what happens is the endon effect comes into play and even patients with monocular clue sometimes can get away passing a vertical pencil test which by as or this monocular clue is taken off when we do it horizontally though there is no <clears throat> no study comparing a horizontal and vertical lang pencil test ever done but horizontal lang pencil test is thought to be a superior over the vertical lang pencil test why do we need the two pencils why can't we do it with the fingers when we are doing it with the fingers it becomes more of a test for proprioception than for a stereopsis that's why we use pencils and one pencil held by the examiner the other one held by the subject per se so this gives you an indication whether stereopsis is present or stereopsis is absent roughly the stereopsis when the patient or the child passes the lang two pencil test he has a stereopsis close to 400 arc seconds that is the uh, norm which is given now when we know the patient has stereopsis or the child has stereopsis can we quantify it further we can use various tests as we were discussing earlier the first and most more most commonly done is the stereo flightus or the tetmus flightus it has a fly on one side the word circles which are called as and the animals so it is based on the vectographic principle these uses this require the use of polarized glasses giving you a uh, stereopsis somewhere between 3000 and 40 arc seconds what is the basic advantage of this is the stereo fly or the titmus fly is very attractive to the child whenever the child is wearing a polarized glasses the fly seems as if the wings of the fly are coming out of the uh, chart so that is why the ch children are more comfortable doing this test but is this test the most common or the most accurate way of assessing stereopsis not really why because of the monocular cues or the monocular clues which are there by which a patient who does not have true stereopsis also can get away having a good stereopsis on a titmus flightus so what do we use here is the uh, things which are available here or the monocular clues are the lateral displacement or the horizontal offset if you can actually see in this picture where my cursor is you see the overlapping two overlapping images this is the one which has a stereopsis clue so this is the monocular clue for the patient to recognize this is probably the circle which does not belong to this box and the second one is if the patient has an alternate fixation the patient can alternate between the two eyes and see which of them have a image jump and thus determine this is the um, 
image or this is the picture which has a stereopsis. How to eliminate this monocular clues is very, very simple. Use the same chart, rotate the chart 180 degree. The same picture which was appearing above the book now seems to be receding into the book. So that is uh, how a person with true stereopsis appreciates. Unlike a person who without stereopsis who is dependent on this monocular clues will still be able to appreciate the same image what he was looking at later. So when you rotate the chart by 180 degree and ask the patient to perform the test, if the patient is able to perform, he's doing with a monocular clue. If he is not able to perform and says that, no, I'm not able to see it out of the book. Now it is receding within the book. That means he is, he is a, having true stereopsis. That's how you identify both of them. And the next important test, which avoids all this monocular clue and thus gives you an accurate stereopsis is the RAND dot test. <clears throat> the RAND dot test uses polaroid vector graph in conjunction with the RAND dots and again uses polarized glasses to be used. And it gives you a much accurate stereopsis between 400 and 12.5 arc seconds. So whenever we are doing near, near stereopsis, what are the points that you have to take into consideration first? As we saw, the child had her refractive glasses or the refractive correction in place. On top of it, the child is wearing a polarized glasses. And firstly, get the child to familiarize with the chart before you start off checking the stereopsis. Now, once the child is familiar with the chart, ask the chi child which of the circle, which of the three word circle is above the chart. Now, the child starts responding much comfortably and much easily. So, this is how you get a near stereopsis. Near stereopsis is by and large done and distant stereopsis is rarely done. So once we know, you grade it according to what is given in the book. Then we have the TNO test, which is less commonly performed based on the Randolph stereogram and uses anaglyphs or the red and green glasses. It gives you an arc seconds between 480 and 115 arc seconds of stereopsis. The Lang test is the most simpler to perform, especially in young children. Why? Primarily because it doesn't use the wear of glasses. It can. It is simple like a card. I'll give the card to the child and ask the child to identify the pictures amidst these random, random dots which are present there. This is based on panographic principles, something similar to what we find in our uh, and the buses and the autos which have two images which are superimposed on it or from one side you see the shiva and one side you see the threshold similar lines this test is based on so this is a real depth stereogram which gives you an, uh, somewhere between 1200 to 550 arc seconds on lang one and lang two giving you a higher grade of stereopsis between 600 to 200 arc seconds so now we have understood how do we know if the stereopsis is present or otherwise based on qualitative test that is lang pencil test and we have identified quantified it with the Help of either the test which use glasses or which don't use glasses. So these are the various tests for the stereopsis. Now coming on to what happens if there is a strabismus in a child less than eight years of age, it can develop sensory adaptations or what we call a sensory anomalies. These sensory anomalies could be in various ranges depending on the degree of strabismus, the constancy of the strabismus and the age of onset of strabismus. So whenever it is by and large, whenever it is less than eight years of age and it has a small angle strabismus somewhere between 10, less than 10 prism diopters or 10 to 15 prism diopters of strabismus, it develops something called as a monofixation syndrome. A larger strabismus or a smaller strabismus in both uh, grades, you could have a suppression, which could also, when it becomes obligatory, lead on to amblyopia and a strabismus which is intermittent and somewhere between 15 and 30 prism diopters give rise to an ARC, which we call it as abnormal or anomalous retinal correspondence. A large squints can give rise to a large regional suppression. In a visually mature individual, it can give rise to diplopia, confusion, a retinal rivalry or a prolonged plasticity. So whenever we are looking at a sensory evaluation in a strabismus, a patient with diplopia or confusion would come with those symptoms. Unlike in case of uh, strabismus individuals who have been having from a long time and having sensory adaptation. So we need to look at these anomalies if they are present or otherwise in order to evaluate and tailor a surgical plan. Let's look at how do we test them further. Test for sensory evaluation of strabismus could be divided, further divided into based on principle. How do, what are the various principles for sensory evaluation tests? One, diplopia principle to haploscopic principle. Or you could also divide on specific anomalies to be tested. You could be testing ARC, you could be testing suppression. Or we could also uh, divide it based on the nature of the test like a qualitative test or a quantitative test. Based on the principle, whenever we look at diplopia test, always remember what do we mean by diplopia? There's one object and we are perceiving it as two images. So that means uh, there is a foveal, extra foveal stimulation. Similar principle is there in a diplopia test as well. In all the diplopia tests, it uses only one fixation target, which is seen by both the eyes, but the 
two eyes are dissociated either with the help of red and green glasses or with the striations on the lenses. So in diplopia tests, in all the tests which are based on diplopic principle, there is only one fixation target. In haploscopic principle, what happens is there is a fovea foveolar stimulation. That means there is one target for each eye. There is two fixation targets. The right eye sees some other target, left eye sees some other target, and we interpret based on what is it seeing, what right eye is seeing, and what left eye is seeing. How do we dissociate the eye here? It is by the use of prisms or glasses. So haploscopic principle could be in terms of fovea foveolar stimulation this becomes important in interpreting the results what we get from these tests in general so what are the tests coming under diplopia principle are our common tests that is bagolini striated lenses worth photo test red filter test and medox rod test these tests are listed in the uh, and degree of dissociation, the meaning Bagolini striated lenses cause the least amount of dissociation and simulate the every day to day condition. Unlike in a Medox dot, which is the most dissociating and uh, which is not commonly seen in everyday condition. And the tests which are based on haploscopic principles would be Synopto 4, a Bilchowski's after image test, or a Lancaster red green test. Let's go and look into one, one after the other. Tests, or we could also classify it as tests for suppression. So in these diplopic principle tests, all the uh, tests which are based on diplopia principle could be used to test the suppression by and large. That's how we remember. So tests for suppression would be worth four dot tests, four prism adapter base out tests, Bacolini striated lenses, and red filter tests. So now let's look at worth four dot tests first. What is suppression? A word about suppression before we get into the depth of uh, testing suppression. Uh, testing suppression. Suppression basically means in the presence of a strabismus, this object is seen on fovea of one eye and extra foveal point of the other eye. So it leads on to diplopia or visual confusion. So how does the visually immature individual or visually immature neuro uh, visual system react? It basically suppresses this image, stops seeing this. So there is an active cortical inhibition of this image which is formed on the strabismic eye, so which is called as a suppression. Suppression again could be fixed suppression. It could be alternating suppression between the two eyes. It could be central suppression. It could be peripheral suppression. It could be facultative or obligatory facultative or obligatory depending on it is a monocular viewing condition or a binocular viewing condition so let's look at worth four dot test which is most commonly done in the clinic as a part of sensory evaluation so worth four dot is done for distance and for near and the target is basically that it has four lights one red two green one light which alternates between red and green so the child wears red and green glasses sees what is seen by the four the four lights and interprets it the same thing is done at near with the help of a worth four dot torch again the same thing as the child to wear or the patient to wear and green glasses see what is seen by them and interpret them so this is uh, uh, basically simple you have dissociated the two eyes there is only one fixation target that is the worth four dot lights which are there so if the patient sees only green lights that means the right eye is suppressed if the patient sees only two red lights that means the left eye is suppressed the patient is seeing all the four lights there are two interpretations that we need to remember one the patient could be orthophoric or the patient could be having manifest strabismus with erc in the presence of that means if the patient is having a strabismus but interprets only four lights on worth four dot may be having an erc and the patient with strabismus with nrc would have five lights as a diplopia or an alternate separation so five lights indicates either a diplopia or alternate separation so normal four lights could be two things one orthophoric or manifest strabismus with erc so this principle holds good for all the tests which are based on diplopia principle what else could we do with the worth four dot worth four dot again could be done at varying distances so it could be done at as we looked at it could be done at distance it could be done at near you could also vary it based on varying feeds that could be at various feeds which gives you a degree of suppression scotoma which is seen in the individual so how what use does it make if the child is fusing for near suppressing for distance probably the child has a monofixation syndrome so it helps in identifying a microtropia or a monofixation syndrome further the degree of suppression scotoma also gives us an idea about state of fusion so if the suppression scotoma is somewhere between one and three degree it indicates a macular fusion if it is more than that it indicates a peripheral fusion so the qualitative test which indicates the presence of a suppression or erc can be made at quantitative by the degree of suppression scotoma which is induced so it becomes both a qualitative and a quantitative test the next important test is a four prism diopter base out test 
So what it essentially means is you place a four prism diopter prism base out in front of one of the eye. Look for the moment. What normally should happen, there should be a movement of both the eyes in the direction of apex of the prism. That is, when we place it in front of the right, left eye, there is a right the both the eyes move to the right now what happens the eye without the prism undergoes a refixation moments undergoes an adduction moment and then comes back this is the normal response a version moment followed by a refixation movement of the other eye so this is it helps in again diagnosing separation scotoma how i'll tell you then it it's, it's a motor test for a bifoveal fixation so look for version followed by refixation moment now let's look at this video of this particular child now, when we four prism is placed in front of the right eye, what happens is a small version movement which is happening in the other eye. I hope it's clear in the video. When we put the same prism in front of the other eye, look, there is no movement of the other eye. So what does this indicate? That means when we put this prism in front of the left eye, the movement shift of the image is within that separation scotoma. So there is no version movement which is happening. So if there is no version movement happening in the other eye with the prism in front of the left eye, that means the left eye has a separation scotoma or a small separation scotoma. So that is how you diagnose a four prism diopter test to be positive. Positive meaning it has a separation scotoma. There could be a lot of false negative and false positive and the uh, equivocal results as well, which is beyond the scope of this talk. But this is how a motor test for a separation scotoma is done. Next important thing is that a Bagolini striated lenses. These striated lenses, uh, these are lenses which are striated at 45 and 135 degree. When we look at the light, what happens is it's seen perpendicular to the striations which are seen. So what we normally see should, uh, how do we do this test? The patient or the subject in question wears the Bagolini striated lenses, looks at the point source of light. We could modify it with the help of a torch or use a pen source of light whenever it is available. The patient looks at it and sees how uh, the patient is actually interpreting it. it. He would normally respond it as a cross, which is with the light in the center. That is, again, indicates a orthophoria or ARC with manifest abysmus, like what we told in Worth 4 dot also. All the tests with diplopia principle Whenever they show a normal response, it means either the eyes are straight or the eyes have a squint with a ERC. Whenever there's a single line seen, that means the other eye is suppressed. So if it is just this line which is seen, that means there is a right suppression and was and otherwise. In the presence of an asymmetrical cross, the patient has a manifest squint with a NRC. So whenever you see the patient saying that it's there is a cross, but it's asymmetrical, it's either in the form of a V or in the form of A, that means it's a manifest squint with a NRC. So when we look at tests for ERC, we've already discussed two of it. One, worth four dot test, which gives you a normal four light response with a manifest squint. Or Bacolini striated essence, which shows a symmetrical cross in the presence of a manifest squint. What are the other tests which are specific for ERC? One, Bilchowski's after image test, which I'll be dealing with, and the synoptophore slides, which could be used to identify the ERC. A word about ERC before we get into details of the testing of ERC. When we say ARC, it either means an abnormal retinal correspondence or a anomalous retinal correspondence. To complete the definition, it means two non-corresponding retinal points acquire a common subjective visual direction. How do we understand it with the easy analog? Keep your fingers or your hands clasped to each other. Normally, it gets into this position. That is the thumb to the thumb, index finger to the index finger. Just slide your fingers across. Even now, the index finger is to the thumb and the uh, middle finger probably to the index finger. This is what happens in an ARC. That means the fovea of one eye is corresponding to a non-foveal point or extra foveal point and acquires a common subjective visual direction. So this is what we mean by an ARC. That means whenever there is a squint, this extra foveal point becomes uh, tuned with the fovea of the other eye. And that is what we call it as an ARC. That means now the fovea is not corresponding to the fovea of the other eye, but the extra foveal point is corresponding to the fovea of the other eye. When we say harmonious or unharmonious, to be very simple, uh, what it exactly means is if the angle of squint corresponds to the pseudo foveal offset. That means if you measure a 20 prism diopters of squint and you place 20 prism in front of the patient and the patient says, I am able to see single now, that means the patient has a harmonious ARC. That means subjective angle is zero. The angle of anomaly or the pseudo foveal offset is equal to the angle of manifest abysmus or the objective angle. That means it's a 
harmonious arc if it is not corresponding then it becomes a unharmonious arc that means the true the pseudo fovea is here this pseudo fovea is not corresponding to the fovea now there's a uh, new point which is between fovea and pseudo fovea which corresponds to the fovea of the other eye and that is what is called as a unharmonious arc there are other forms of arc as well which is called as a paradoxical type 1 and type 2 arc which is beyond the scope of the talk so i would not be discussing on it so these are the various forms of arc which could happen now how do we test arc arc as we discussed to already worth four dot bagolinis now the third one would be belchowski's after image here a vertical image or a vertical streak of light is shown on the right eye and a horizontal streak of light on the left eye which i do we shine vertical which shine i do we shine horizontal normally separation scotum are horizontally over so vertical split is always on the or the vertical beam of light is always on the strabismic eye and the horizontal on the normal eye that's how by convention be used and the reason behind it is the size of the or the um shape of the suppression scotoma so the stimulation of the after image is done under monocular condition and now the now each fovea is stimulated we are not stimulating the fo extra foveal point so now what happens as the patient how do we how does the patient see it here the interpretation becomes different because it's a haploscopic test if the patient sees a normal identical cross symmetrical cross like this this area being spared from the light that we have shine, shined in this means the patient has a nrc only that means the patient with orthotropia esotropia or exotropia with nrc would have a symmetrical cross on a bilchowski's after image test why because the fovea is stimulated so the fovea of one eye is still paired with the fovea of the other eye in the nrc with or without strabismus so that is why it is a symmetrical response and an asymmetrical cross always represents a arc where is the symmetrical where is the horizontal line if the horizontal line is on to the right side or there is a crossed image then it is a esotropia if it is an uncrossed it is a exotropia because it is the images where the eyes are pointing so the, the projection of the fovea per se so whenever you have a symmetrical cross what do we understand the patient has nrc it only indicates nrc it doesn't talk about the orthotropic state or otherwise in the presence of a belchowski after image the synoptophore is an uh, topic by itself i would not be covering it in detail synoptophore basically has uh, is Uh, dissociates the two eyes with the help of the prisms uh, sorry with the help of the mirrors which are there in the amblyoscope this uh, synoptophore can identify the grades of binocular vision by the simultaneous perception slides or the fusion slides or the stereopsis slides which are there it can also help to identify the arc by measuring the objective angle of scrutiny you when objective angle of the st uh, strabismus is measured when the arms of the tube are measured are moved by the uh, observer or the A doctor in question, and when the patient turns the tube themselves to see the single image, and then the angle is noted. So, if objective angle and subjective angle, subjective angle is zero, and it's equal to the objective angle, that means there is harmonious ARC. Or otherwise, it's a unharmonious ARC. So, to sum up, what we have discussed till now, a sensory system. Firstly, look at stereopsis, which is qualitative or a quantitative test. Test for suppression or ARC. Most commonly done will be Bagolini and Worth for that. We could have much more in terms of synoptophore and Bill or Bilchowski's after image. So, this completes a sensory system evaluation. Now, look at motor system evaluation. Whenever we're looking at motor system evaluation, again, the first step would be to observe and see. if there is any presence of abnormal head posture those are motor adaptations of squint then look at the how do we measure the squint either with light reflex test or cover test the ocular movements the important things like hes charting and diplopia charting and others so uh, look at this child whenever a child comes to you with strabismus to your clinic the first and foremost thing that you have to look at is ask the child to read the snellen chart and look at what is happening to the posture of this child child goes into a chin down posture adapting a chin down adapts a left tilt and a right face turn that means there is an abnormal head posture happening in all the three uh, axes of it in this particular child so if we look locate the ahp depending on which axis it is is it along the horizontal axis the x axis or the vertical axis with the y axis or the anteroposterior axis with the z axis whenever the adaptations happen along the horizontal axis which is x axis which is basically along the horizontal axis chin up or chin down or it is along the vertical axis that means it's a face turn to the right or face turn to the left or it's along the anteroposterior axis along this axis so this has to be tilt to the right or tilt to the left so that's how we 
define abnormal head posture or designate. Now, when we know there is an abnormal head posture, what do we do next? In all squints, is there something? If it is there, how do we measure it? How do we measure it? With the help of orthopedic goniometer, which is readily available, or you could make it your own. Use a 360 degree protractor, put two scales, one longer, one shorter, and then measure the squint. How do we place the scale? The first scale will be along the fixation target that the patient is having. The second one along the long axis of the head or along the anteroposterior axis of the head. The angle between these two would give you the abnormal head posture. Sorry. The next important thing would be, how do we measure it? So the measuring would be in terms of light reflex tests, which are Hirschberg tests. Hirschberg tests basically based on the principle that whenever we shine the light, the light falls on the cornea and forms the first Purkinje image. And this first Purkinje image is what we are taking into consideration on the Hirschberg test. So one millimeter of decentration is equal to seven degrees or 15 prism diopters of deviation. This is an approximate number considering that the cornea is of the normal size. The pupil is not eccentric. It is almost normal. So this is how uh, a Hirschberg test gives you. It can give you when the light reflex falls on the limbus, it gives you around 45 degree of deviation close to 90 prism diopters of deviation. So that's how you do it. Whenever the patient has a poor vision in one of the eye, what we do is take the cue from the Hirschberg test and use that approximate prism diopters of squint and place it in front of the normal eye. See, in this child, that child has a right exotropia. So when the prism is placed on the left eye, uh, that is the normal eye, the light reflects on the right eye is centered. So this prism diopters gives you the angle of strabismus. Modified Krimsky's test by and large underestimates the angle of strabismus, but this is the only way to measure the squint if the vision is very poor in one of the eyes. So this gives you an angle of uh, deviation, which is there. The next important thing we would do to measure the squint is an alternate cover test in order to know the presence of strabismus or otherwise. So what we need for that is fixation target. Fixation targets are basically accommodative target. The torch light is never ever an accommodation target. So to diagnose strabismus just with the help of a torch is absolutely wrong to do it. So the fixation target could be a Snellen chart for distance or any kind of a uh, vision charts for distance. For near what we use is either a near vision chart could be used or we normally use a lang fixation stick. So what is the importance of fixation target or use of an accommodative target? So look at this child. The light reflex seems almost central in both the eyes. So do we say that the child doesn't have strabismus? Keep a fixation target in front of the child. Look at that squint coming in. So that is the importance of using an accommodation or a fixation target, which helps us diagnose the squint much more accurately and more correctly. So that's how fixation targets are very, very important. So when we do uh, and the next important test would be to do a cover test. Cover test consists of three things. One, cover test. Second, uncover test. And cover uncover test or an alternate cover test. So cover test detects tropia. Uncover test detects phoria. Alternate cover test detects both tropia and phoria. So which eye do you cover? In the presence of a manifest trabismus, we always cover the eye which is central. So when we cover this eye, the eye moves from in to out. That means the child has an esotropia. So if it moves from out to in, it has an exotropia. Similarly, what do we use to cover the eye? We could use occluders, which are readily available. We could use the hand itself, like what I'm using in the first video, or we could use our thumb. Look at this very young child. How do we use fixation target? Obviously, the child is not able to read. Use it. Use a toy. Ask the child to fixate on the toy. As and when the child fixates the toy, you see the squint coming in. So that's how you do a uh, alternate cover test, even in a very young child, and don't rely on the torch light or the light reflex test that we did, uh, discussed about it earlier. So the alternate cover test indicates the presence of a stubbismus or otherwise. What are the points to remember or the prerequisites before we do a cover test? First, the eye, both the eyes should have a central fixation before you do a cover test. If the patient had an eccentric fixation, we cannot do a cover test. And the patient should have equal vision or good vision in both the eye, better than 612 is what we normally use. And the patient does not have a gross limitation of ocular movement. In the presence of a total ophthalmoplegia, he cannot do a cover test. So that is what it means. Further, whenever you're doing a cover test, always correct the abnormal head posture before you do it. You do it in the primary gaze, you do it in the right gaze, you do it in the left gaze, you do it in the up gaze and the down gaze. 25 degree of up gaze, 35 degree of down gaze is what we normally do. And with vertical deviations, whenever there's a hyper or a hypotropia, also do it the cover test on a right tilt and a left tilt. 
So once we know that there is a squint, we need to measure it. How do we measure it? With the help of prisms. We could use a loose prism or a prism bar. The first and foremost is you do a simultaneous prism covetous, which measures only tropia. So you cover one of the eye and use the prism on the other eye. So put both the things together. If there is no movement of the eye under prism, that means the uh, squint is completely neutralized. If there is movement, then increase the amount of prism. Still, there is no movement of the eye under the prism. So that gives you the measurement of squint. It measures only tropia and it measures the angle under normal binocular conditions. So there is no phoria which is detected. The most commonly done in our clinics is the alternate prism cover test. Use the fixation target. So whenever we are neutralizing it, look at this very carefully. There is a small refixation or a redressal movement which is happening. That is again an endpoint of neutralization. Endpoint of neutralization in alternate prism cover test is either there is no movement or there is redressal movement. Redressal movement where the both the movements, the outer and the inside movement or the movement on either direction or of equal amplitude and that is when we say that it's completely neutralized so that's how we do it you also do it in other cases like right and left case you also do it for near so we have got that it did an alternate cover test you knew there is squint you measure the squint with the help of prisms you did it for distance you did it for near you did it for all the gazes and tilts is this all sure. there is something more to it so what do we do you also need to understand that we cannot stack two horizontal prisms together. Suppose there's a squint which is not getting neutralized with 50. 50 prisms, which is a maximum prism in your prism box. So you cannot put a 50 and put a 10 on top of it because 50 and 10 is not getting up to 60, but it's adding up to 70 because the deviation of the prism is a trigonometric function of the angle of the prism per se. So do not stack two horizontal prisms together. You can always stack a horizontal and a vertical together. Two, Second important thing, how do we position the prism? So all your loose prisms are placed in frontal plane position. The frontal plane position means the back surface of the prism is parallel to the orbital frontal plane. So that is what we mean by frontal plane position. If you're using a prism bar, place it in the apprentice position. So the position of the prism can define the amount of angle that you're getting. And the next important thing is the effect of the plus and minus lenses. So what do we mean by it? Suppose we are using measuring it in a a patient who's wearing a convex lenses, hyper patient which, who's wearing a convex lenses. So what does it happen? In the presence of esotropia, this lens acts like a base out prism. This base out prism reduces the amount of prism needed to neutralize this esotropia. So that means the plus lenses is measuring a deviation. In the presence of plus lenses, we're measuring a deviation lesser than the true deviation. What happens if the patient is exotropic and still wearing a biconvex lens or a convex lens? It acts like a base in prism. So similar to the base out prism, here the base in prism is there. So this base in prism lessens the amount of prism which is required to neutralize the exotropia and hence plus lenses measure less deviation than what is the true deviation. So in the presence of a hyperopic individual, what happens if the patient is myopic? In the myopic individual, the same and the concave lenses would act like a base in prism. So it acts like a base in prism where you need a base out prism. So the amount of prism you need will be more. So similarly, in an exotrope, this will act like a base out prism where you need a base in prism. So this, in essence, what it means is if the patient is wearing a more than plus four or plus five, in the presence of a plus five or a plus four lenses, a plus lenses would measure lesser deviation, a minus lenses will measure more. So minus measure more is what the mnemonic, which is most commonly used. How do we get rid of this? Either, firstly, use a nomogram, which is there in the uh, textbooks and convert the deviation, what is a true deviation, to you can take out the glasses, switch the patient on the contact lenses, then measure the deviation, which will give you the true deviation. So in the presence of a prism cover test, the effect of the glasses, which have an inbuilt prismatic effect, also needs to be considered. Once we know the deviation, you have measured the deviation. The next important thing about motor evaluation would be look at the ocular movement. So we know the nine gaze position. These six are basically marked because these are called as cardinal positions of gaze. Why they are called cardinal? Because in all this position, there's only one muscle of each eye acting. Suppose you're looking at the right gaze, it is the right lateral rectus and left medial rectus. So it's easy to pinpoint which muscle of each eye is acting in these cases and hence called as cardinal positions of gaze. How do we denote it? You could use circles to denote it. You could use a cross or you could 
denoted this way. And any under action or over action is graded from minus 4 to plus 4, under action and minus, over action and plus. Another important point about ocular movements would be versions versus ductions. So look at this child. The child, when the child looks to the left, it seems as if the left eye is not abducting. There's a limitation of abduction here. And when the child looks to the right, again, observe carefully, it seems as though the abduction in the left right eye is also limited. So does that mean the abduction of both the eyes are gone? Before coming to that conclusion, close one of the eye, check for monocular movement. See that the right left eye now completely moves. Similarly, the right eye also completely moves. So that means you have to check ductions as well as the versions individually and not comment on each other otherwise. So this can happen whenever the child has a long-standing squint or a cross fixation. So at the end of all these tests, we know when there is tropia or phoria, ocular movements are normal. If the prism coverter shows the same amount of squint in all the cases with either of the eye fixing, we call it as a concomitant squint. If the ocular movements are limited, APCT is showing different squints in different gases with a right eye fixing and left eye squints in, squ uh, fixing. It's an incompetent squid, which could be paralytic or restrictive. Again, which brings us to the question, can we differentiate these two, paralytic and restrictive? There are a couple of tests which ha helps in differentiating these two. We finish off with a few videos again. So the first and foremost important thing would be a forced duction test. Whenever you're doing forced duction test for a rect eye, what we see is in this particular patient, the elevation was limited. So hold the uh, Hoskins forcer at three and nine o'clock position, prolapse the globe, and then move it in the direction of limited ocular movement. So whenever we are moving it in the limited ocular movement, it doesn't move above. That means the muscle opposite to the movement of the limitation is what is restricted. If it moves normally, then it is FDT negative, which is paralytic. We can also do a FGT test in order to know the tug of the muscle. The next important thing that we do is the saccades. Whenever you're checking saccades, look at this right eye, which is not completely abducted. So ask the patient to switch the fixation between my finger and the pen that I'm holding. Whenever we're doing it, look at this. There is hardly any movement or initiation of the saccad in the right eye. That means the saccades are very, very slow. The initiation of the saccade is at fault. When the initiation of the saccade is at fault, that means it's a paralytic squint. The other important test that helps us identify a paralytic and restrictive is a HES charting based on haploscopic principle. Patient wears red and green glasses. The red light is controlled by the examiner. The patient fuses the green light on the red light wherever the patient sees and helps in charting it further. Swap the uh, glasses again. Now the right in front of the red will be in front of the left eye and chart it for the other eye, that is the left eye. Then uh, we mark it on the chart. I'm not going into the details of it. It helps us again differentiate a paralytic and a restrictive squint. Just for the completion's sake, a HES charting cannot be interpreted individually. So you use a diplopia charting as well. The diplopia charting uses the red and green glasses. The patient looks at it, it's a subjective test, tells us how the patient is seeing. Horizontally displays, vertically displays, torsionally displays, and then mark it on the chart. So the other test would be testing for vergences, Lee screen, fusional amplitude, measurement of AC, PAC3 step test, which become, uh, which are specialized tests for the motor system evaluation. Just for the completion, say, we look at the double medox rod as well. The double medox rod helps us identify torsion, the presence of torsion or otherwise. So it is used most commonly vertically so that you get a horizontal image. If the horizontal images of the two eyes are parallel to each other, it's normal. If there's a tilt, it indicates the presence of a extortion. The amount of torsion is the sum of the two eyes. We can't identify which of the eye is starting. So to summarize, you always look at the covetous, measure the deviation with the SPCT, simultaneous prism covetous or alternate prism covetous. Then you look at the ocular movements, versions and ductions and the special tests in terms of FDT, FGT or in terms of clinically uh, checking out the seconds rather than the other things. So evaluation of the squint is never difficult. It has to be done in a particular pattern. You can't jump in whenever the patient has strabismus, look at the ocular moment, and then do a cover test, then do a sensory evaluation and come to a conclusion. It has to be done in a sequential order. One, two, it has to be done that all the tests are complete. You cannot interpret a cover test in the absence of ocular moment or otherwise. So it has to be done in a particular way before we conclude and come to a diagnosis. Sensory tests should always precede the motor evaluation of strabismus and a complete sensory evaluation and a motor evaluation helps in diagnosing a strabismus. 
and the proper assessment is crucial to make a surgical plan and uh, most importantly observation goes a very long way in a squint because all our tests are based on observation and clinical notes that we make so the power of accurate observation is commonly called cynicism by those who haven't got it as quoted by george bernard Shah. so again remember minions there are two eyes but we see as if we see through one cyclopean eye thank you Uh, Dr. Soumya, wonderful talk, and uh, it's a very extensive topic, but I think you were uh, very nice in making it short and concise, and uh, what was important, I think, was definitely covered. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll take questions. Uh, I think we'll just give a little time for them to type in their questions. Sure, sir. And we'll take them as they come. Really enjoyed your talk. Very Thank nice. you, sir. I think there's one uh, question coming up by Dr. Neeraj. Should stereopsis be a part of routine pre-refractor evaluation? If yes, which test would be preferable? Uh, Dr. Neeraj, if you're talking about uh, doing it as a part of a screening test or a test which is done before a LASIK procedure or any kind of refractive surgery, I would say yes. Uh, in our protocol that what we follow at Shankara Bangalore also that we do a, a squint evaluation before any patient undergoes a refractive surgery. It's done as a part of it. What test we normally prefer would be the basic test. We do a stereopsis in the form of either TNO or Randot or a tetanus fly. Either, all the three of them equally do good. If you have a Randot, Randot would be preferable to do it uh, before you do and for a refractive surgery. There's one uh, question coming up by Dr. Sriram Charan. Uh, one doubt on stereopsis test, measurement of arc second, is it the measurement of the distance between the cones? See, we can't really measure the distance between the cones. What we are looking at is the uh, fusional ability or the depth perception of the individual, which we say it as an arc second. It's not the direct conversion of the distance between the cone. All the tests have to be done, ma'am, or one is sufficient as arc seconds is variable among the tests. Yes, it's definitely variable. As we discussed, a tetmus flight test is less reliable compared to a Randot test. A Randot test and a TNO would more or less match whenever you do a test under the same lighting condition, under the same uh, circumstances for the patient and without doing a motor test. And so both of them would coincide with each other. All the tests need not be done. You need to just do one test and do it the same test. Consequently, in, in case you are following it up in terms of prognosis of the patient or otherwise. So that is exactly why you do it. One of the tests would be sufficient. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Srinivas. Uh, can you elaborate how do we do a prism cover test in a Duan syndrome? So when we are looking at Duan's, you know there is an ocular movement limitation and the patient has a movement limitation. So suppose you're thinking in terms of a uh, left Duan syndrome where the abduction is completely remitted. I'm talking of a isotropic Duan's. So whenever we're doing at isotropic Duan's, the patient invariably has an abnormal head posture. So correct the abnormal head posture first bring him to the primary gaze and look for the movement of the either of the eye. Suppose the left eye is squinting. When we cover the right eye, ask the patient if the patient is actually able to see the Snell and chart with the left eye. So what in most of the cases happens is the left eye is not able to see at all without the head posture. So that is the primary difficulty in a duance when you do a prism cover test. So what you can do is put a very small prism in front of the uh, left eye so that the patient says that he's able to now see the Snell and then start doing your prism cover test and refine your amount of prisms which is required. So that's exactly how you do it in any case of uh, gross movement limitations, provided it's not very complete in all the directions like a total of the uh, now we have Prerna asking up, vision is always checked as a routine before evaluating stabismus by covering each eye separately so that can become fusion. So how does it affect this uh, squint evaluation? Uh, very pertinent question. But 
primary uh, problem in uh, prana and whenever you are evaluating is going there is a fix in two things one we need to know the vision because we need to know which of the test that you could do it if the vision is very poor obviously we can't do a cover test you will have to do a kremskis or a rely on your hirschberg reflex itself and if you don't do a uh, if you do a vision and then do a squint evaluation it does affect your sensory evaluation which becomes very pertinent or very important especially in cases which have a uh, borderline fusion or a uh, unstable fusion suppose that the patient has an intermittent xt and you have done a vision with a prolonged cover for a very long time and then you check his stereopsis or check his uh, sensory evaluation it may show a separation or an alternate separation and a very poor stereopsis the pa same patient comes to you with the next follow up and you check the sensory evaluation before you do a vision test it will probably show an alternate separation or a fusion for one of the distances and a better stereopsis so in all the patients who have an inter mid and squints it does affect in a greater way compared to the ones which have a constant stubbornness i think that answers your question this another question is it necessary to measure the deviation in all the cases in all patients with a squint see by and large you definitely need to evaluate in all the cases and all the patients in all the cases what i mean is basically at least uh, primary gaze right and left gaze up and down gaze and if there's vertical right tilt and left tilt you can omit the tertiary gazes if as a part of routine evaluation even in a patient with ixt which is the most common squint that we see in our uh, clinic or in our part of the world there is something called as a lateral incompetence which exists which alters your surgical plan and that is why it is very important that you measure the deviation in the right gaze and left gaze up and down gaze in any case of concomitant squints also we have pattern strabismus which is a and v pattern how do we know a and v pattern is basically by and doing an up gaze and down gaze measurement which will not be understood if you don't do it in up gaze and down gaze so the pattern strabismus check for the incompetence is very very important especially before surgical planning if you're not planning for a surgery and the patient is uh, you have found a squint uh, incidentally and the patient is not interested in part of the squint elaborate squint evaluation may be omitted uh, for the time being which may have to be done later but as a part of routine you have to do whenever you are evaluating the squint it means that you have done a complete sensory evaluation complete motor evaluation documented everything in clear um, words which can be read by another person as what you have mentioned or what you have noted there are no questions uh, the favorite thing would be either you have understood everything or you have not understood everything i hope the former is true okay uh, there's another question thanks uh, there's another question which is coming up how do you differentiate between alternate squint with poor fixation in one eye and a unilateral squint um say i didn't touch upon the fixation pattern primarily for the want of time and things to be covered whenever we are talking of fixation pattern when we say poor fixation it's better that we clarify what we are talking about whether we are talking about central fixation or uncentral like an eccentric fixation uh, are we talking about in terms of unsteady fixation or the unmaintained fixation whenever we say unmaintained fixation again it could be like the fixation could be alternate fixation completely but with a preference to one of the eye so whenever uh, uh, unilateral squint is basically means that two things one there is unmaintained fixation of that eye or the fixation there is a fix uh, strong fixation preference to one of the eye whenever we are talking of maintenance of fixation we are looking at two things maintenance of fixation through a blink through a socket there are two other components which we quantify it further before we say it as a unmaintained fixation so if it is not maintained through a blink and a socket and 
that means that there is a strong prefer fixation preference to one of the eye. When we say alternate squint, what we basically mean that is there is an unmaintained fixation, but it's maintained through either of them or maintained through at least one of them. Then we say it is an alternating squint and the alternate or in unilateral squint also is based on sensory evaluation or just the motor evaluation. You look at the presence of suppression or or otherwise, if the eye shows a strong uh, suppression of uh, suppression of one of the eye for distance or near, and the vision is a little less, or vision is equal, with the fact that you are seeing a, a unmaintained fixation, then it goes more in favor of a unilateral squint than an alternating squint. How many times is it essential, uh, doctor? Dr. Shweta Suryakant is asking how many times is essential to do a squint evaluation, especially a prism covetous in a child before actually planning surgery. See, uh, by and large, what we look at, especially since you've asked it as a child, it largely depends on uh, the time of the day that you're doing it. If the child is very cooperative or the child is anxious, irritable at that point of time that you're doing a covetous and how for what are you doing it? Are you doing it in terms of surgical that you are planning a surgery now and that's why you're doing it? You need to do at least two constant measurements a month apart or at least two months apart before you plan in a surgery. Just with one surgical measurement or with one prism cover test measurement, you'll not be able to plan surgery in that particular in any any patient, in any child. So that is essentially important that you get at least two measurements a month, say six to eight weeks apart before you plan in surgery. If you are not able to get any of the readings like you get got only the ocular moments in right and left gaze tertiary positions you're not able to evaluate the covetous are showing variable sometimes you're finding it like a 30 prism et and sometimes you're getting at a 50 prism et the child doesn't wear glasses regularly things like that then you'll have to do it as many times till you get a consistent measurement and you're you are sure for yourself yes this is what i am seeing and this is what i am getting so till that time that you will end up uh, doing the prism covetous significance of measurement of ahp and its clinical application so whenever we're looking at the abnormal head posture there are two things one there are many squints where we uh, the squint is very minimal and you're doing a surgery basically for AHP. Consider your Duane syndrome. You have a, uh, say, around 15 prism diaptos of esotropia, but he has a 30 degree of face turn. So why are you doing surgery? You're doing surgery basically to correct the AHP. So how do you know your surgery has worked or otherwise based on your measurement of AHP? So that is why you need to measure your AHP before uh, to understand whether your surgical planning worked. One. Two, it also helps in your diagnosis. See, uh, let me give you an example with a DRS again. DRS type 1 and type 2 or a type 3 DRS. If the patient has a small XT DRS and the patient, how do you differentiate a type 2 and type 3 rather, sorry. So if both of them can have an ortho or an XT DRS or an exotropic DRS. If in the presence of an XT DRS and the patient has a face turn to he has a left eye XTDRS and has a right face turn. It goes more in favor of a type 3 DRS. And if he has an opposite face turn, it goes more in favor of a type 2 DRS. It also helps to understand whether you're leaning with a paralytic or a restrictive stabismus. It also helps us understand what is the binocular fusional potential of the individual so that you don't mess up with it. The patient will have a diplopia post-op. So that is why it becomes very, very important to look at your AHP whenever you're doing a prism cover test. So that's why I said in all the squints, you have to do one after the other. How do you measure the head tilt with a goniometer? So in a head tilt, what you basically do is now you place your one arm, which firstly you are placed it in the fixation distance. Now you place it perpendicular to your floor, one arm of it. The second one, you place it along the long axis of the patient's head. So that's how you measure the head tilt in a goniometer. Uh, Parul is asking us, can you explain again how worth for our distance and angle subtended detects central scotoma? See, uh, this is the norm which is given Parul. Uh, I think I'll just go back to that slide for you. See, uh, what we have is the separation scotoma, what is angle subtended at the fovea can be noted by at what distance are we using the worth four dot lights. So that's how we can grade the separation scotoma. So if you are using it at six feet, the angle which is subtended is around 1.1 degree and at one feet it's around 6.4 degree. So the, depending on this, you can uh, look at uh, having which of it 
the size of the separation scotoma can be noted. So I hope that is clear for you. Uh, Ranjini is asking, I meant how to place the goniometer in the head tilt. You place the goniometer on the back side or the occiput when you are measuring the head tilt. How do you plan surgery in case of lateral incompetence in XT patients? In XT patients with lateral incompetence, what is the most common? If you do the routine surgical measurement, the chances of having an undercorrection is more. So you alter the plan accordingly so that you don't get a gaze incompetence in either of the cases. So uh, the various surgical plans, probably it's out of the scope of this talk. That's why I didn't discuss about it. You undercorrect it depending on how much of the difference that you're getting at, how much the degree of lateral incompetence that is seen. Anshipa is asking, can you explain the measurement of inferior oblique overaction and underaction? How to explain them in the exam? Okay. So, whenever you're looking at um, inferior oblique overaction or underaction, what we are looking at is uh, how do you explain it in the exam? So, in your inferior oblique overaction or underaction, it's graded as plus one to plus four in underaction or overaction. So, whenever you're looking at, say, your right eye inferior oblique overaction, so ask the patient to move towards the left. If the eye uh, the overaction is not seen even in this position and the patient is, looks up now in the left uh, levo elevation. Only then you see the overaction coming up and then you probably are looking at plus one or plus two overaction. If you see it even in the version movement, then you're looking at something at plus three and plus four. That is your clinically, how do you look at it? How do you explain it in the exam? You look at the inferior limbus in both the eyes. If the inferior limbus of both the eyes are in the same plane, you're still not having any overaction. If this overshoots now and also abducts, that is a grade four overaction. If there is no abduction movement, just an elevation in the version movement itself, it's grade three. If the inferior limbus is slightly above, but it is still that you're able to see the inferior limbus very, very minimally, even in this version movement that you're appreciating it, it's around two. And if you see it, the overaction coming up only in the tertiary gaze, then it is grade one overaction. So you look at the inferior limbus compared to the inferior limbus of the other eye whenever you're looking at inferior oblique overaction. That is one way of looking at it. Two, you can also look at the angle which is formed by a line joining the medial canthus and the lateral canthus to that inferior limbus or the visual axis line. Look at this angle which is formed and then grade your inferior oblique overaction. So what we normally expect as a postgraduate student and to be explained in the exam is you look at the inferior limbus compared with the inferior limbus of the other eye and look for the elevation movement which is seen. Uh, Madhuri Shivaram is asking how long do you advise patching after squint surgery exo in a child below two year, 10 years? I understand that um, you're probably talking of XT surgery which is done and the patient you want to continue patching. Uh, if you're talking in terms of amblyopia and patching, I would always prefer that I have treated amblyopia before I did a surgery. Uh, if you're talking about alternate patching to help in the control of squint, I don't do it after surgery. Uh, if there is an undercorrection and that is why you're doing an alternate patching, then probably that is not the option of choice and you should look at something else. What is the cause for the underaction? Uh, Amar is asking, is there any suggested scheme to use for new patient in the sense of sensory evaluation, like starting with stereopsis and worth for dot, if both are normal, is that enough or we need to do some more tests? Uh, See, it depends on case to case scenario. In any particular uh, patient, if the patient has uh, that is why mostly I say that it's like a jigsaw puzzle. If your sensory evaluation and your stereopsis is matching with your vision assessment and your motor assessment, and if all of them seem to be pointing at the same thing, it is enough. If there is something more to it, that is uh, your sensory system uh, evaluation is not matching with your motor system, or it is not matching with your vision test, then you need to do further tests. And the further tests are amended if you're dealing with a paralytic squint or a restrictive squint. If you are dealing with a concomitant squint, just doing a stereopsis in birth four dot should suffice by and large considering that rest of the parameters are fitting into uh, 
whatever you have tested as well. How do we proceed evaluation if XO greater for distance than for near? Okay, uh, this is another test that I said as a special test, which I didn't go into detail further. So whenever you have an XT for distance, which is more than for near, what we do next is a prolonged patch test, which is done for at near. How do we do it? Prolonged patch test, this was originally described by Marlow when he said that you uh, patch it for one week. We don't do it that way. What we do is for 45 minutes, you patch one of the eye, call the child and back after 45 minutes or call the patient back after 45 minutes and then do your alternate prism cover test again. Taking care that you don't remove the occluder or the patch that you have put on one eye before you start measuring it. That means you don't allow for the binocular fusion to happen before you have started measurement. Then you look at the near measurements now. If the near measurements builds up, coming closer to or within 10 prism diopters of distance measurement, then you know it is a pseudo-divergence excess XT. If the near measurements are still lesser or, and the XO deviation is much more, like more than 10 prism diopters difference from the near, what we do next would be a plus three diopter test or check for AC by A ratio. So you place the plus three lenses in front of both the eyes and then start measuring the near deviation again. And the, if this deviation again builds up, it go, again goes in favor of a pseudo divergence XT. If both the things don't build up and the near deviation is lesser than the distance deviation and the difference is more than 10 prism diopter, you name it as a true divergence XT. And this true divergence XT would have its, um, you'll have to take care whenever you're making a surgical plans. Okay. Um, very nice. Uh, discussions, uh, Dr. Somia. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we'll be ending this session uh, now because I think we're running, we're running beyond the time. But nevertheless, it's been wonderful. And the discussions is what is very, very important in such sessions. And the questions actually keep the audience also involved. So thank you very much, Dr. Soumya. It's been wonderful and a very great learning experience. And before we all sign out, I just want to inform that the Tomorrow we'll have no uh, session, being a Sunday. Uh, we'll have our next session on Monday, where we'll have a topic by Dr. Meena, who's a glaucoma consultant at Bangalore. Dr. Meena will be talking on glaucoma drainage devices. The time is the same, it's from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And the link is the same too. Uh, thank you all and Dr. Samya for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks.